let me begin by introducing myself. My name is uh, Andy, uh, Andy Fryer. So I uh, head up the uh, operations of Better Impact across uh, Australasia, so primarily Australia and New Zealand. Uh, I've been with the company for uh, about 15 years in one capacity or another, so I have quite a, quite a long history with it. But I also want to introduce my colleague Didier, who is uh, sitting in on the call today. Didier looks after all of our um, uh, sales and new inquiries and, and so forth. Uh, so he'll be a, a key contact for those of you who might be interested in exploring uh, the, the software further. Uh, I'm based in South Australia. Didier is based uh, out near Geelong. So uh, we cover a, a bit of territory. Um, so welcome to you all. Uh, today's uh, session uh, clearly is called Is Volunteer Impact the Right Software for Your Volunteer Program? And so this really is an opportunity to uh, learn a little bit more about uh, better impact and what it is that we do. Um, just going to pop everyone on mute for a moment. Uh, so uh, this is not designed to be any kind of hard sell. It's simply an opportunity for you to learn a little bit about our software. There's a lot of choices on the market. And uh, in making a decision about the kind of software that you uh, might like, um, there's a lot to consider and it is a big decision for your volunteer program. And so we want to be very transparent and open and help you to understand what we do so that you can de determine whether we're a good fit uh, or not. So I'm going to talk a little tiny bit about our company, where we come from. I think it's important that you learn that. But just want to begin by uh, talking a little bit about what we are going to cover off on uh, today. So we are going to uh, begin with some kind of preliminary uh, bits and pieces. We will then dive into a kind of a, a demonstration of the software and then allow you to, to ask uh, some questions and we'll talk about next steps as well as we go. Um, so while we do have a designated time for questions, um, if you have a burning question as I go through, please just raise your hand uh, and uh, Didier and I will, uh, will either stop and ask, answer that or feel free to pop something in the chat. And uh, Didier will, um, you know, interrupt me and uh, pose your question to me uh, as we go. So uh, either way, the the most important thing is to ensure that we get your questions answered. So why better impact? So one of the things that we hear a lot uh, when people come to us and they're starting to explore software solutions is that they often come to us with a problem. That is, they've identified that in their own volunteer programs, there's uh, some stuff that's not going as well as planned, and uh, it's time to, to make a decision about uh, moving forward. So these on the left are the really common uh, problems that we hear about. Um, so one is that these days there's just too much data entry, and indeed as leaders of volunteer programs, often if we do our job really well, what we, what we learn is that we very quickly kind of become victims of our own success in terms of the fact that our numbers grow, but our resources don't always grow with the volunteer numbers. And so modern day software allows us to very quickly be able to um, uh, manage that in, in better ways and spend our time supporting our volunteers in more meaningful ways as well. We also hear a lot about people using multiple tools to undertake the, uh, the task of leading and supporting volunteers. So something for recruitment, something for rostering, something for uh, recognition, you know, something to keep notes. Uh, so what modern day software like Better Impact does is helps to pull all of that into one system so that you're just focusing on the one uh, space and have that one source of volunteering truth. Both of those things lead to the most common thing we hear is that people just don't have enough time to properly support their actual volunteers any longer. So they find that, you know, whenever they're, they're jumping into the office, they're spending all their time sitting in front of a screen rather than actually engaging with their team members and supporting them and helping them to be the best that they can be as well. Um, a really uh, uh, the bottom point there is that people are often on tight budgets. And so we have always worked primarily in the charity sector and we really try and pitch our, um, our pricing at the charity and not for profit sector as best we can, because we do recognize that sector is on a budget. We'll talk more about pricing at the end of this. We, we want to be very open about how that all works, 
But the other really big ticket item is this, this thing around security of confidential information. And we think of the last year or two where we've had breaches with Optus and Medicare and you know, Medibank and, and a few others. Um, and so not only is that a major ticket item now for uh, our organisations, but we are fielding more and more questions from our volunteers around the security and privacy of their information as well. So it's a really big ticket item. One of the things I really want to highlight right at the outset is even though we work uh, and, and pitch our pricing at the not-for-profit sector, we take no shortcuts with that stuff because that is absolutely paramount to everything that we do. So on the right-hand side of this slide, you will see a couple of little black shield icons um, without going into too much technical uh, jargon. Um, what they tell you is that we are ISO 27001 and 27017 certified. What does that mean? It means that we hold the highest level of certification and accreditation that you can have for cloud-based software um, anywhere in the world. So these are international standards that we have attained, but that we also have to work very hard to continue to be assessed against on an annual basis. So we can do no more than we do in terms of gaining those kind of certifications and having a bunch of internal policies. So uh, we, we do uh, tick a lot of boxes in that space. So just a tiny bit about us, and then I'll, I'll get more into looking at the product. So our company kind of started by fluke. Uh, our CEO, a guy called Tony Goodrow, um, was the chair of a small hospice in his hometown of Burlington. And uh, at the time, he ran a small software like web design company, and he was chairing this committee that was building this hospice and decided that they needed to have some volunteers involved. And from that, he kind of said, well, I've got a little bit of technical expertise. How about I cobbled together a bit of a database to help with the volunteers? Uh, 20 something years later, so we were founded in 2000, so 23 years later, the rest is, as they say, history. Um, we uh, now work globally. We are still a small company. I think at last count, we are somewhere around 30 staff in total, but we have offices uh, here in Australia, but we also have um, our head office is based in um, Canada, just south of Toronto. We have offices in London and also uh, in Chicago uh, in the US as well. Um, we also work very closely around the globe with groups like Volunteer Island and Pista Magica in Portugal. So we have a, a widespread uh, of, uh, of customers. Um, our specialization has always been volunteer management software. So that sets us a little bit apart from some of the other players in the field where their core objective has been kind of CRM uh, general CRM kind of databases and then they've morphed a little bit and have a side project for you know how volunteers can fit into that bigger picture whereas we started with volunteer management and in fact we only did volunteer management for about the first 16 years of our existence and we've, we've got a couple of little side products I'll talk to you about right now uh, in terms of the fact that we now also have modules uh, for donors and organizations who um, have clients, particularly in kind of a one-on-one -on -one visitation uh, kind of environment with volunteers and for organizations that also have a membership base as well. So we're not gonna dig deeply into donor, client and member today. We're gonna focus on volunteers, but if either of those um, three options are of interest to you, please reach out to us after this. You can reach out to Didier and we can provide a second demonstration or point you in the right uh, direction with that. Most importantly, and this always sounds like a bit of a pitch, but it's not, it's actually what our company is based on, is that we see ourselves as we're a here to help company. And so we are really big on making sure that we can support the not-for-profit sector in a whole range of different ways. We also just happen to do volunteer databases really, really well. But beyond selling databases, we do other stuff. So for example, in the last couple of days, we have co-hosted with the big American and Canadian professional associations of volunteer leaders, uh, a virtual conference across North America. So that involved flying a bunch of people up to our office in Canada and then beaming that out to volunteer manager networks across the States and Canada. So that's one example. We are sponsoring the Volunteering New Zealand conference uh, at the end of this month. Um, 
we also, I believe, sponsored the AVM con conference in London in the last few weeks as well. So we're always looking at ways that we can grow the sector um, in addition to simply selling databases. So uh, with that bit of a preamble, let's get into it. Um, so the first thing that I would like you to understand is that at our core, we kind of have two variations of our software. The first variation is what we call a standard account. A standard account is essentially a single database. And in that single database, we have all of our volunteers, we have all of our administrators, we have all of the jobs we need people to do, and everything is all housed in one place. Now, a single account can be as large or as small as you like. It can be used uh, across multiple locations if that's your preference as well. Uh, it's really up to you. Um, my background uh, is that I spent 20 years running a large hospital-based program with about a 1,000 volunteers across 12 locations. Back then, we had a single database that did all of that because we managed all of our volunteer team centrally. For organisations who have multiple locations or sites or they have a, a particular need to keep their different teams of volunteers quite segregated from one another, and a good example of this would be a council, where they want to keep the library volunteers only visible to the librarian and the recreation centre volunteers only visible to the people responsible for the rec centre. Then this, this diagram that we see on the screen at the moment comes into play. So the other variation is what we call an enterprise system, which I always describe as being a little bit like an octopus. So it has a head and it has tentacles. And in that scenario, every tentacle is its own individual database but they have some commonality at the top, at the head level. So again, in this example here, imagine sub-account one is the library, then the librarian can only see his or her team and not the, the other three teams in this scenario and so forth. Whereas the people right up there at the, the very top, they are able to potentially see every volunteer in every account and email every volunteer in every account whereas people at the local level can't do that. So this is the definitive kind of model to, to use if you have that real issue of, hey, the librarian can't see the recreation centre volunteers. That's a, an internal kind of control that we have. This would be the option uh, for that. So they're the two models. Uh, for the purpose of today, we are going to focus on a single account, just to give you a sense of the, the key features. As I mentioned, in addition to volunteer impact, we have those other three modules. Um, and so you can feel free to reach out to me about those as well. All right, I think it's always helpful to hear from uh, some existing users. So let me just uh, click on the screen here and we'll hear from four current clients and what they love most about uh, our company. Hi, I'm Moana from the Cancer Society of New Zealand's Wellington Division. I've been using Better Impact now for nine years in over two different organisations, and I love it. Over this time, the system has grown with the changing needs of volunteering, and there are regular updates to the system. For me, the favourite feature is being able to look up a volunteer quickly, to see a photo of them, to acknowledge any milestones such as their anniversary with us or their birthday, and being able to track easily when a qualification needs to be updated. I can't rave about the system enough, but it has definitely assisted my team and I to be more present and active with a large volume of volunteers and to support our engagement with them in a seamless way. Hi, I'm Victoria Banzi. I'm from Uniting Care Queensland. I've been using Better Impact for just over five years now. I would have to say my favourite thing about Better Impact would be the flexibility. I've used it in a several organisations, but the flexibility meant that the organisation where I started with zero volunteers through to United Care now where we have over six and a half thousand volunteers, I could comfortably use Better Impact and make it my own um, in, in all those occasions. So I would say far and away, that's my favourite feature. Thanks. Hi, I'm Matthew Taylor from the City of Australia in South Australia, and I've been using Better Impact for the last 12 years and love it. For me, its favourite feature is how it can we use the communication tool to keep volunteers informed about their volunteering. Because Better Impact has been designed with volunteers in mind, it is easy to use and volunteers love it. 
Hi, I'm Jodie Batchelor. I'm the Volunteer Engagement Manager here at Austin Health. I've been using Better Impact since about 2016, 2017, and I absolutely love it. My favourite part of the system, and it's really hard to actually just come up with one thing, but I would certainly focus on the personal profile reporting. You can fully customise it to get as much data as you need, as much information as you need, or as little as you need um, in that one report. It's incredible. So there you go. Um, all of those were completely unscripted, um, even though it sounds like, and I loved it, um, but people do genuinely uh, love the product. And the thing that I found really interesting when they sent me those videos back was that they all highlighted really quite different things um, from reporting through to volunteer interaction, which is a really important element of the software to understand. And we'll talk a little more about that in a moment. But, um, but the software essentially does have two interfaces. So it has the interface that we see as administrators, but it is designed to have volunteers be active in their volunteering and actually um, interact with their volunteer uh, opportunities. So signing up for opportunities, undertaking e-learning, keeping their details up to date, downloading their rosters, uh, receiving news from you. So, um, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to jump into a demonstration now uh, and show you around. And uh, time permitting, I want to give you a, a higher level overview of the key features that we see as administrators. But I also want to jump in as a fake volunteer and kind of show you what that uh, would look like as well. So let me just uh, see what I can do here. Um, I'm just going to end that. And Didier, can you see the database? Yep, great, fantastic, thanks. All right, so what we're looking at here, folks, is the view that we would see as an administrator in the software. So this is the home page that you would see when you log in. And right here on the home page, there are a whole range of uh, different features that are designed to help us to be able to undertake volunteer engagement in a really quick and easy way. I'm not going to focus on everything on this page, but I do want to highlight a few key things. So first of all, just to give you a sense of how easy the software is to navigate, this little toolbar in the top left-hand corner is typically where we are going to uh, begin. And you'll just see here that whenever I make a selection, so if it's something I want to do that is related to a, a profile or a person, this menu here uh, is called People. And as I select that, what we see over here in, in the column on the left are all the things that relate to people. Communication, now we have some stuff around communication uh, and so forth, configuration. So it's pretty easy to navigate your way around, but um, what you will see, actually, before I show you this, let me just actually jump into a different page. Um, I think this makes, a bit more sense because one of the things we talked about earlier was that really this is an end-to-end -end volunteer management solution. So if we think about it as being that, then how about we begin at the beginning and the beginning in how we can uh, uh, interact with volunteers is actually to recruit them. And in fact, even before recruiting volunteers, we can advertise the opportunities that we have. So what you'll see on this page here is a branded page that would have your branding on it. There would be a bit of information in here all about your volunteer program and, and how you need volunteers and the kind of uh, value that you place on them. And then what potential volunteers are going to learn about are the current opportunities that you have. So they can jump in here, they can learn about what's current, and then ultimately what we want them to do is fill in an application. So um, without going right into the, the whole application process, what occurs when somebody reaches this page? First of all, you can have them agree to some terms and conditions if you want to before they even start the process. And then they're going to they're gonna undertake a two-page process. Pretty quick, pretty simple. Page one is tell us who you are, so contact information. Page two is any other information that you would like to learn about that person at the point of application. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. 
But also importantly, you'll see here that a volunteer applicant is going to be um, asked to create for themselves a username and also a password. So that username and password is critical because that is going to enable them to log into their own volunteering page uh, moving forward. When we get a brand new volunteer uh, apply, a few things can occur. So immediately you can set the software up so that that applicant receives an automated and personalized email from you. Dear Sophia, thanks for applying. Here's the next steps in our process. We will also see that we have a brand new applicant um, uh, right here in this green bubble. Um, and we can also set ourselves up to receive an email alert about that as well. So immediately we can jump in here, look at our brand new applicants. So in this case, it's somebody called Sarah, and I can come in and view all the details Sarah has provided, or I can edit her details, I can flick her uh, an email right from here. But importantly, if I've decided that Sarah's initial application looks interesting, once I take an initial action with that, I can use these bubbles to start to move her through that volunteering life cycle. So you'll see here that we have a number of green bubbles. So after a person comes in as an applicant, we can move them to be to being in process. <clears throat> in process, people are those where we're waiting for them to, we need to call a referee. We're waiting for them to undertake induction. We're doing a police check, all of those kind of things. It's a place where we can monitor the team that are treading water while we are waiting for them to become a part of our fully accepted team members. Beyond that, we have two uh, tagged um, uh, statuses called inactive and being short and long term. So think of these people as being people that have gone away for six months to Europe or someone's had some surgery and they're not active for a couple of months. Or maybe it's volunteers who help us just with the annual Christmas fundraiser. So they're not part of our regular team, but they are part of our extended team. And then when people leave or we choose not to accept them, we can archive those records, which means the records stay in our database. They're just kind of buried, but we can always dig them back up if we ever need to do that again. Um, so status plays a really important uh, role in the life of the database. <clears throat> also around those green bubbles, you will see that we have a series of what we call system alerts. So these system alerts are designed to tell us stuff that is going on in the database. So it might be, who's having a birthday this week? Ah, there's uh, seven people. I'm going to flick those people an email. And now very quickly, I could, uh, happy birthday, I can send them all a personalized email. This coding here would go to dear Martha, Murray, Kathy, and Ezra. Um, and now I've undertaken that bit of work. So we can do that with um, birthdays and anniversaries, but some of these other alerts tell us even more important information in terms of the leadership of our volunteer team. So while these are nice to have, these are kind of more critical. The two that I just want to highlight are these two here, expired and expiring qualifications. So what these tell us um, is information about people who have something that has now expired, like a police check or a working with children check or a driver's license or an annual certification, those kind of things. These are all built based on the needs of your own organisation. So in actual fact, the qualification page starts life blank. And so very quickly, again, I can see that, you know, these dozen people here, they all have their annual certification that's now expired. This group have their CPR that is, has expired. And again, you know, I can take bulk actions with these people if I want. I can update the dates. I can send them a text or an email. Um, and I can stay on top of those compliance measures quickly and easily, simply based on the tools that are built right into the software. There are some other alerts that we see on the homepage. I'm not going to work through all of those today, but these all tell us similarly really important information. The other one I will just highlight just while I think of it is this one here that currently doesn't have any active um, entries in it. But we have a variety of ways that volunteers can log hours in our software. And one of the ways is they can use one of our many time clock mechanisms. And using time clock, a volunteer is by default, they're going to log in when they arrive, they're going to log off when they leave. I'll talk a bit more about that later. 
But when somebody does arrive and they log in, this alert here will light up and it'll say, hey, uh, Sophia has arrived. She's working in the op shop as a cashier. She got in at 9.17 a.m. So even if I'm sitting at home with the flu, I can very quickly drag my phone out or open up my laptop and make sure that all the volunteers have arrived for the day. And for those of you who may have volunteers who work in the community, just as importantly, you can make sure people have logged off at the end of the day and gotten home safely. So that's a, quite a helpful one as well. Uh, also on this homepage, just uh, one other thing or, or a couple of things I'll talk about. One is where you need to navigate regularly to regular pages to do work. You can save those as favorites. It's a quick and easy reference. And same with searches that you might need to do from time to time. Um, if you need to do regular searches, you can very quickly pin those searches right here to your homepage, which will very quickly take you to a list of people. So for example, if I have arrived at the office and two of, two of the people on the information booth have called in sick this morning, I can say, well, I wonder who's on the information booth uh, backup list. Because I've previously saved this list of people, I can see that 48 people are on that list. And again, I can quickly use a pre-saved and pre-created uh, template. I don't know if there's actually one for this, but I can just select that and hit send. And now those people can get an email to say, hey, folks, we have a vacancy tomorrow morning on the information booth. If you can help, can you go in and backfill that for us? So, uh, you know, they're, they're simple, quick, easy tools that you can build in that eliminate big pieces of work and bring them back to the push of a couple of buttons. Um, the final thing I do want to just mention um, comes back to the thing of we're a here to help company. And so I want to reassure all of you that we have really great levels of after sales support. Uh, we believe we do that better than anybody else. We think it's a major point of difference. Um, so um, we have, um, uh, I think we have one of, one of the team members popped into our chat, internal chat yesterday and said that we actually have six and a half hours of training videos available freely 24 hours a day. So there's about 200 videos in that, in that suite of, of shorter videos. Um, we also have built right into the database a comprehensive uh, um, help library. I didn't mean to type help, but that will do. We'll just grab one of these. Um, so you can search for anything that you might be struggling with. In this case, I'm looking for custom field headers. This is going to give me a bit of information about that, but it's also going to link me to other articles that might be helpful and videos that might be available as well. And then in addition to all of that, we also have a live 24 hour a day chat room that you can jump into as well. So all of that is a part of your subscription um, uh, and is all available and uh, there for you um, at any point to give you a hand and to help you out. All right, let me jump in now and show you what a volunteer record looks like because that is pretty fundamental to everything. So. For a volunteer, the quickest, easiest way is to search for the volunteer in our quick search box. You'll notice that we can put photos of volunteers in here. I can see the status of Jim, he's accepted. And when I open his profile, I immediately will see a dashboard. The dashboard is going to give me a summary of all the things that Jim has been doing. So I see a summary of his total hours over the last year. I see a breakdown of the kind of uh, the, the jobs that he's been undertaking, his next shift and so forth. And I can also see any badges that he might have attained as a part of his volunteering as well. So our badges system get built by you and they recognise four key things. Um, hour milestones, anniversary milestones, qualifications or pieces of training that a volunteer might have attained. And then the other one is what we call feedback milestones. So feedback fields, I'll talk about really quickly here, get built in by you and they help you to measure something more than hours. So think of a driver at the conclusion of a shift as they log off, they can see a question that says, hey, how many kilometres did you travel today? How many passengers did you transport? So now not only do we know that our driving team of 10 gave us 100 hours, we can see they drove 1,000 kilometres and transported 250 people. We have all those metrics um, available to us. And uh, Victoria, who was on the video a moment ago, 
I was actually on a call with her yesterday and she showed me a big um, impact report that Uniting Care Queensland had recently built. And she was actually using those feedback filled uh, metrics to build graphs directly into that impact report. So all of that is being done automatically by your volunteers at the time that they're logging off at the end of a shift. So badges are a really important way of incentivizing uh, volunteer effort. Uh, I'm not gonna run through all these tabs, you'll be pleased to know, but um, contact information is exactly that. Um, but I just wanna focus on these two here, qualifications and custom fields, because these are the two parts of the software that are 100% built based on your own organization's needs. I'll begin with qualifications because I already introduced you to a qualification back on the home page. So qualifications serve two very distinct purposes in the life of the database. One, they track expiry or renewal dates where we need to track those things for, for compliance reasons. The other thing that qualifications do is they act as not negotiables. So they are a skill or a quality, they're a license, they're an attribute that a volunteer categorically must have in order to be considered for a role. So using my driving example again, as I create my driving role, the software is going to say, hey, Andy, are there any not negotiable qualifications that go with being a driver? And I say, hell yeah, you've got to have a current driver's license or you can't do that. So I attach that to the job, but I attach it here in Jim's profile as well. And once I've tracked that qualification in two places, the software will do two things for me. If as an administrator, I am looking for drivers, the software will say, hey, Andy, here's the 17 people you can safely consider for the driving role because they meet all the needs. If I'm a volunteer logging in and I'm looking for opportunities and I'm looking for vacancies that you have that you would like to fill, you can actually create the activity or the job so that only the people with a driver's license get to see the driving role and get to sign up for that. The 37 people that don't have a driver's license don't even know that that job exists. So it gives you the peace of mind to say only the right people are seeing the, the, the right set of jobs and there are only those people are allowed to sign up for them. And again, you're not having, you know, people jumping in and signing up for stuff that they really don't have any knowledge about. So qualifications serve those two key purposes. Custom fields then is uh, other than things that fit into the qualification area and contact information, everything else tends to fit into the custom field area. So I, I kind of tongue in cheek often say that custom fields are a kind of a bit of a glorified Excel spreadsheet. They're, they're a place we store stuff and we look it up. But they do actually do a little more than, than just simply help us to store information. So there's a couple of really key things that they, that, that, that they do. First of all, I mentioned on the application form that there were two pages, the first page being contact information, the second page being anything else you want to ask them. So as we build these custom fields in, so how did you hear about us? Why do you want to volunteer at the museum? You know, we can attach these to the application form. So now not only do I know that Gregory lives in Brunswick, I also know his motivation for wanting to volunteer and the days of the week that he can help and what skills he has and all of that information. So that when I get this ding in my inbox to say there's a brand new applicant, I've got enough information to make an informed decision of whether I want to move that person forward or not. So that's one purpose. We can attach them to our application. Um, secondly, we can look this up and we can look it up for a whole range of reasons. So I might want to send an email to the people, all the people with a size small T-shirt to let them know that the size small T-shirt has arrived in the office now three weeks after all the other T-shirts. Um, but more importantly, I can use this information to create and generate kind of reports about my team. What's the gender breakdown? What's the, the languages people speak? What's the cultural diversity of my team? What's the age group? So we're able to kind of build that information out as well. Um, and then if I scroll further down this page, what is really typical is going to be stuff like 
uh, fields of information that we would never have a volunteer complete on the application form, but information that we critically need to know for our checks and our balances. So intake or induction checklists is a good example or comments that a referee might have given to us about the volunteer. We can make notes about that that are private notes that a volunteer would never interact with, but we have for our own purposes. So it's a really it's really a working part of the program to help us to, to track uh, our volunteer team. The, um, the only other one of these that I'll show you really quickly is this communications tab. Uh, and just to show you that when we email volunteers, the software will automatically capture a history of the emails that have gone out, same with any text messages that might have gone out. But importantly, we also have a private note log area in each volunteer's profile as well. And uh, right in here, we can leave private notes that are only ever visible to um uh, to administrators have, that have access to that uh, area. The, the thing I didn't tell you about custom fields that I think is important is there are actually eight different ways you can capture data about your team, and we see them here. So we've got short text and long text boxes. We have simple yes, no drop down fields, but then you can create your own customized drop down fields as well. Um, we can uh, pop in dates and numbers. We can upload documents directly into a volunteer profile, like a resume or a copy of a driver's license. And then we can use check boxes as well. So again, you get to choose how you want to capture that data and it all becomes searchable. All right, so that's a little bit about a volunteer profile. Um, let's talk about the jobs and rostering because that's always an important part of the software. So we call a volunteer job an activity. And a little bit like our um, custom fields, this page starts life blank. So you get to build these headers. So these can be whatever you like. Back in my hospital life, um, these were the 12 locations at which our volunteers work. So this was maybe the op shop. And these were all the jobs that happened in the op shop. And this was the board and committee tab. And I had all my board and committee members under that. And this was the gift shop and all my gift shop rosters were in here. So you get to build these and clump them together however you like. And then you get to build the jobs themselves. So um, essentially, we have two kinds of jobs you can create. One is called an unscheduled job, something like our newsletter editor role here. This is a job we need a volunteer to fill, but we don't. it's not time and date specific. Yes, I might need the newsletter draft on my, on my desk by the end of the month, but I don't care that Didier is, whether he's in the office with me on a Monday morning at nine o'clock working on it, or whether he's sitting at his kitchen table or at a local winery on Saturday afternoon at two o'clock. All I care about is someone's been allocated the task, the task is being done. The other kind of roles are those that are date and time specified. So our East Gallery attendant, you know, we need two people um, in the East Gallery, Monday to Friday, nine to one, and then another two from one to five. Anything that has a schedule associated with it, we would build uh, in here. Now, we're not gonna go through all the nuances of building a job. Um, but suffice to say, we can build in job descriptions. As I mentioned earlier, we can use qualifications and status to, to determine which volunteers get to see these opportunities. We can set a minimum. We can set a maximum. We can associate um, feedback fields with it. And, of course, we are going to tell the software what the schedule or the pattern looks like where we need to attract and recruit volunteers. The important thing is that once we've created our jobs, volunteers can become associated with them in, in one of two ways. First of all, I can give volunteers jobs as an administrator, but then as I've been mentioning, volunteers can also see where I have gaps and they can self-assign to those gaps as well. It is really common that organisations will use a hybrid approach there. So for instance, I might put a team leader 
on every shift, but then let other volunteers fill the gaps around them. Or I might make sure that my older volunteers who are less tech savvy get their regular day and regular time, but I let all the youngies come in and fill all the gaps around them. Um, other organisations, they already know exactly what volunteers are coming on what day of the week. And so they just go through and bulk assign people maybe for the next 12 months. So there's a whole range of different ways that you can do it. It's not a one size fits all. It really is about how your organization uh, does those things and what works best. The important thing is that um, once you have somebody on the roster, there are a, a variety of um, tools that are built right into the software that help you to then be able to understand how you're tracking. So for instance, in Jim's profile, under the schedule tab, I can very quickly jump on in here. I can see what's coming up for Jim, but importantly, I can view a personalized roster just for Jim, just for the month of October. I can even email that out to Jim if I want to do that. Um, more broadly than just looking at a roster just for Jim, under the reporting tab here, I have a whole range of what we call schedule reports. So these are rosters. So I'll show you two of those really quickly. Single activity by month is one that I used to use a lot. Uh, and this gives you a bit of a calendar view like we just saw for Jim, but now we're looking at a single activity for a month. So for October in the East Gallery, I can see these are the people that are on the roster. I can see there's some gaps and, and so forth. I can look at different views other than a calendar view as well. Uh, this will just give you a sense of that. So in this case, this is looking day by day, all categories, all jobs. So we can see that eight o'clock uh, today, we've got in the guest services area, the new exhibits guide is Justin. Here's some contact details and so forth. So the software will do the hard work for you and produce these rosters uh, to, to keep you informed uh, about all of that. There's also another tool in here under this assign tab, which will tell you where you have gaps and will identify for you the places you most need to focus your attention. So um, forgive the busyness of this page when it loads. It's a busy page, here we go. So if we were to look at tomorrow, what we see is we've got about seven or eight jobs happening tomorrow. We can see they're all in the guest services area and we can see the different jobs. Um, and then we got a bunch of stuff on the right, which I'm not gonna worry too much about. The way that you would learn to uh, understand this page is actually just to look at these little colored icons. And the icons work like this. A tick is good, an exclamation mark is not so good. An exclamation mark tells you you have not yet received or not yet met the minimum number of people you need for that shift. Whereas the, the tick tells you you can rest easy because you've now got somebody uh, helping you with that. Uh, Didier, did you have a question or there's a question in chat? No, sorry, all good. I couldn't see your full screen, but I just um, went to the left and I can see it, so all good. Sorry. Andy. Okay, cool. No worries. So again, we can very quickly see who's on each shift. And again, if I, we've only got two people in here, but I could take, again, bulk actions and remind people about the shifts that are coming up. Um, more importantly, though, with the red exclamation marks, which is telling us we've not yet met the minimum, this page is actually designed to help us to do that. So without going too much into all the numbers on the right and confusing you with that, one of the numbers I see next to my information booth uh, attendant here, for example, is the number six, which is actually telling me I've got six people on the backup list for this job. So right from this page, I can click on the name of the job. I can look for people that are on the backup list. I can search for those people. Now, uh, let me just grab a couple of these. So there we go, there's our six people. And then right from here, if I want, I can assign them or I can look them up. I can edit them, I can view them, I can send them an email, I can give them a phone call, but now we have Virginia rostered on that shift and now we have a blue tick. So don't get too caught up on that page, but the page very quickly says, here's where to focus your attention, here's where you can rest easy and where you need to focus your attention. Here's some tools to help you to fill those gaps. Uh, okay. Two other things, and then I'll jump across and show you the volunteer view. Um, one of the other things I want to let you know is that we have e-learning built into the software. 
So um, e-learning can be used to train volunteers. So they will watch content and then they will answer, uh, where are we here? Um, so they will see some content. Now, content can be um, links to videos. They can be linked to PowerPoint presentations. They can be PDF documents or text or images. And then essentially once we've presented some content, volunteers will answer some multiple choice questions to prove that they have read and understood the content. And when they submit that and they pass, um, what happens is that a qualification field in that volunteer's record will automatically be updated. So you have the ability to build all of that in uh, for your volunteer team. And in addition to actual kind of full-on training, we now have a lot of people using, uh, using e-learning to have volunteers simply agree to things like photo release forms or codes of conduct or confidentiality forms, that kind of thing as well. So, uh, um, so that tool uh, is built in there. And the other thing I was going to uh, mention that I would talk about would be the logging of hours. So hours can occur in a whole range of ways. So again, we can log hours on behalf of a volunteer or volunteers can log into their profile and log hours. But we do have a range of time clock mechanisms. So time clock can be that you have a tablet or a computer set up. Uh, if you have volunteers arriving and leaving from a central location, and when they arrive, they enter their username or you can even download and give them a QR code and they can scan a QR code to log in and log out. They will select the job they're doing on that day. It'll start the clock. And then when they leave, they log back in, they log out and potentially answer any um, feedback fields you've asked of them as well. We also have an app for volunteers. It's called My Impact. <clears throat> and using the app, there is another mechanism for logging hours called um, mobile time clock and with mobile time clock volunteers can actually log in and out by opening the app on their phone when they arrive and leave uh, <clears throat> so uh, all of those are possibilities um, and then once hours are in the software the software will produce a whole bunch of different reports so again I'll just very quickly show you one of those this is an hours by category report uh, so, you know, not only do you kind of get the numbers, you get some pretty little graphics that you can copy and paste in your annual reports, all that kind of stuff uh, as well. But there are a whole range of, of different reports that will automatically be populated um, once you have hours in the software. So that's hours by volunteer. All right, let me jump into one last view very quickly and just show you what a volunteer will see. Didier, thumbs up if you can see the My Impact page. Yep, great. All right, so I'm just logging in as a fictitious volunteer. Now, again, a volunteer who would have their My Impact, our My Impact app on their phone would see a, a, a mobile version of this as well. So, again, first thing to note is the page is fully branded to match the branding of your organisation. Pierce, my volunteer, will see a summary of the hours he's given um, this year and across the lifetime and this week. He'll see his upcoming shifts and he can, if he wants to, embed those straight into his personalised Google, Yahoo, Outlook type electronic calendars. He'll see any badges that he has. And then it really importantly, the software beyond being a database also enables us to be able to communicate with our team. So we can leave group news in here for all of our volunteer team members to see. And we have a lot of clients now that actually have done away with a physical newsletter and use this as a live, living, real-time uh, newsletter to keep volunteers up to date with what's happening. Um, but you also have the ability here to be able to leave personal notes for a volunteer to see at the time that they log in. So all of that is built right into the software. We can link with your socials and we can share documents with our volunteer team members over here as well. Um, <clears throat> just across the top really quickly, the opportunities tab will show the volunteer where we have vacancies that we are looking to fill. So again, remember here, the only thing that Pierce is able to see are things that we have allowed him to see. So in this case, he can see the library trolley, he can see he's already on the roster for some of these shifts. 
um, but he can sign up for some additional shifts if we want him to. He also has a schedule button so he can see what's coming up for himself. And again, if we have allowed him to, he can remove himself for some of these shifts. He can also, again, view or download his own personal roster. And while we're on that topic, up here in the uh, contact information, a volunteer can self-subscribe to either receive a once a week automated email that has their next two weeks worth of shifts on it. They will automatically be sent to them on a Sunday night. Or if they use Yahoo, Google, Outlook type calendars, they can actually sync their personal calendars with their upcoming shifts. So their upcoming shifts automatically appear in their calendar without needing to do anything. Um, hours, again, this you can have this switched on or off, but it's a place where potentially volunteers can log hours. Again, here we see some feedback fields associated with this particular job. Volunteers can see a report of um, their activity. Uh, if they want to do that, they can download this if they need to take it to an employer or an educational institution. And then from here, they can also reach out and contact uh, key people around the organisation or even committee members, if they're part of a committee, they can even reach out and email other members of a committee as well. Uh, and finally, under their My Profile tab, there are a range of things that they can do. So they can access training, they can see their badges, they can update any qualifications or custom fields that we have allowed them to see and update. Um, and importantly, they can keep their contact information up to date on our behalf as well. So they're always in control of that and they can update their password and their username and, and all that kind of stuff as well. So that's just a very quick uh, look at a volunteer program uh, profile. So with that, let me be quiet and see what questions you, you may all have. Anybody Andy, have a question? Andy, it's Gregory here. Um, <clears throat> just in regards to the e-learning, I noticed you put an agreement up there in regards to photos. Um, if there are other documents that, you know, you wanted volunteers to look at, like, you know, various policies or whatever the case may be, would, is that where they would go? Is there a somewhere else for them? So it, it depends a little bit with, with kind of policy and agreements and stuff. It depends a little bit on, um, on at what point of the process you want people to be filling some of that stuff in. So, you know, in some cases, there is, is potentially a policy. So I'll give an example. Some organisations will say, hey, it's a requirement of being a volunteer that you must do a police check. It's not negotiable. Sure. And so in that case, they will often use the policy document on the application form to do that because then people are aware of that and have to agree to it before they ever even create a profile. Mm -hmm. But where it's not that, that urgent, um, the e-learning is a really good way of doing it. And I'll tell you why. Um, it's a really good way to do it because when you create, let's say you've got a code of conduct and a privacy policy and a mm. whatever, let's say you've got three or four things mm -hmm. or more. Um, when you create each of those individually, you can then generate an individual link to each of those. So what you and what we have a lot of people do now is I apply, you review my application, you decide you want to move forward with me. You flick me an email to say, hey, Andy, thanks for your application. We're really keen to have you on board. The next thing we need you to do is click on the four links below in this email and review the four documents that we uh, require you to agree to as a part of this process. So the volunteer will click on the link, they'll enter their username and password to go into that e-learning environment. They'll review them all one by one by clicking on the links. As they do that, the four qualifications get updated. You can be alerted to the fact that now done that, and now you can move on to the next stage. So they can do that in their own time. You don't need to be fussing about that it just makes it nice and quick and easy. Okay, thank you. Just one other question, if I may. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm just thinking about the um, operability or the, it looks pretty user-friendly, but, but many of our volunteers are 
um, uh, they have various degrees of of um, digital literacy, if I can put it that way. So I'm just wondering about the interface between what we enter as administrators or the organisation as opposed to what a volunteer may enter. And so does that, all that cross-reference? It does. So, so everything is interconnected. Right. Um, so I'll, I'll say a couple of things about that. One is um, I hear this all the time. Our volunteers are a little mm. bit older, a bit less digi digitally connected. Um, but having done this for a very long time now, like when, when I first began and was working with some very large charities, and in one case I can think that they had done a survey and the average age of volunteers was like 74 at the time. Mm. They said, mm. hey, we just, we're not comfortable in uh, having our volunteers in this environment. They put off for six, seven years doing that. And eventually they came back to me and they said, Andy, we can't put this on off any longer. We're going we're gonna to introduce our volunteers to this. We are going to give them some support and help to understand how to do it. And off they went to do it. And they came back a few months later and they said, I wish we'd done that five years ago. It was so much easier mm. than we ever imagined it would be. So mm. my experience has always been as long as you give people the right training and tools and support, mm. they don't have any great dramas with learning how to use the software. But even for those people, and you know, let's say you've got 5% of your people that dig their heels in and say, no, buggy, you are not using this. Mm. Uh, I didn't sign up for this. Um, then that's fine. Everything that a volunteer can do through the volunteer portal, you can do for them through the administrator portal. Yeah. So you know, if someone refuses to use the time clock, you just manually enter their hours. Let the other 95% of volunteers that want to engage with this kind of technology get on with it and, and do that and save you a bunch of time. But just focus on the 5% that are at the squeaky wheel rather than letting the squeaky wheel kind of drive the, the train, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So does the software, would it indicate anywhere whether a volunteer is actively using their app or actually, in, you know, actively engaging with it? Like how yeah. would we know? Yeah, there, there's a search you can do that looks for the last login date that a volunteer mm -hmm. has made. And so if they've never logged in, it'll, it'll show up as a blank field. You'll be able to see that they've never logged in. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Andy. No worries, Zach, you have a question. Zach from the Brunswick Tool Library. So I just had a question about the shift reminders. Um, currently the system we're using now does an hour before shift reminder. So if they start at 10, it gives them a tech uh, uh, app notification at nine. Is yeah, that something yeah. that you can tune in or is it just the two options of the weekly and the, um, the two options you said before? Yeah, so, so the automated uh, the automated options are the once a week um, reminder to say, hey, you've got shifts coming up or the embedding into the personal calendars. Um, right. But an administrator at any point can also flick a, a separate email out. So you can create a pinned and saved search. It says, show me all the volunteers that are on the roster today. And when you rock in or you're eight o'clock in the morning, you could push a button, open that list of people up, use an email template to say, don't forget you're on the roster today. We look forward to seeing you later in the day, whatever. Um, yeah, great. Just to remind people that that is it. Now, you would have to take that action, but with a yeah. pinned and saved search and, uh, and, a, and a saved pre-made email template, it's a push and mm. do button. Um, yeah, I did have another question on, on that as well. So you, you showed like the outgoing side of that text and email interface. When the volunteer either texts back or emails back, is that still within that same interface? No, so it's, it's a good question. So our text messaging is one way only. So a, people, a person cannot reply to a text message. Um, we, uh, we don't have text messaging enabled automatically because it's one of the conditions that we like people to understand. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody replies to an email, the email will actually go and find you in your regular Outlook box. So you don't need to be logged into the database seeing if there's any messages you need to follow up on. Those messages will come and find you. You don't need to go and find them. Gotcha. Thanks. No worries, Didier. Yeah, just got a question from Janet. Um, is there a way to track donations or fundraising events and results? Uh, yeah, so... Um, 
using just volunteer impact, you would need to do the bulk of that um, creatively using custom fields. Um, donor impact, the other module I spoke about earlier, that has more capability of tracking fundraising events and where donations have come from and, and kind of campaigns that you might be embarking on. Uh, you know, it is designed more for donations, whereas this is designed more for volunteers. We definitely do have some organisations that use custom fields to track, you know, money that might come in and that kind of stuff, but it's not ideally built for that, but you can definitely, there would be a workaround. Cool. Any final questions before I move on? All right, so just two last slides, folks. Um, just in terms of pricing and costs and all the rest of it, um, just to let you know that, that uh, the, the way our billing works is based on two things. So, so it's an annual subscription, and that annual subscription is based on two things. The number of accounts that you have. So in a single standard account, there's one single fee per year. In an enterprise, there would be a cost per tentacle or sub account per fee uh, per year um, to give you a sense um, those annual fees are always less than a couple of hundred dollars per year for the sub account um, and then on top of that there is an annual fee which is based on the total number of volunteers that are active in your database so the way we determine active is we look at volunteers who have the statuses of accepted or long or short term inactive. So you never build for applicants in process or archived records. Uh, on our website, uh, betterimpact.com.au, there is a pricing uh, drop down tab there. On that page, there is a quick calculator in the top right hand corner that will help you to very quickly uh, estimate your annual costs. Uh, and then further down that page, about halfway down the page, there's also a quote calculator where you can actually create a formal quote and have that sent to you as a PDF. And that quote calculator, in addition to calculating the annual costs, will also build in any kind of initial support or training that you might like as well. So it'll walk you through all of that and then spit a kind of more formal quote out as well. Um, and of course, you can always, uh, on that page, you'll see links to book a, a discovery call time with Didier where he can also answer any further questions that you might have about uh, costs and pricing. Um, there are then no other kind of hidden costs. We don't have, you know, kind of, you know, other add-ons. It's just a, a one-time fee that gives you access to unlimited administrators. It gives you access to all of our uh, support mechanisms. So everything is in, all inclusive in that price. All right. So, just to kind of wrap this up then, folks. Um, so uh, as I said uh, just a moment ago, you can always jump on uh, and just and have a, a greater conversation with Didier about uh, your own organizational needs. He'll be able to answer any of those questions uh, for you. So you'll see links on our website for a 20 minute discovery call with him. Um, also on our website, you will see the opportunity, uh, and I mentioned the quote already, but uh, the opportunity to dive on in and create for yourself a free trial account. Now, we don't want credit cards or any of that kind of guff doing that. It's just the opportunity to jump on in, create a, a single standard account that you can get in, you can build some fields, you can play, you can add some fake volunteers. Um, we have a little kind of bot that'll walk you through the key features and show you how to build things. Um, so a trial account is a really good way to get in and actually have a play. And just so that you know, um, if you get into a trial and you're really digging it and you're really building it, it up, you can actually start to build the kind of fields in there that you would want to be capturing for your organisation. And after a month, if you decide that it is for you, just be aware that one of the things we can do is convert all that work in your trial to be your brand new account if you want to move forward. So that you can work for a month in it and then if you move forward, you haven't lost all that work and have to start again. So, um, so I would encourage you to do that as well. Um, and then finally, we will send you all a follow-up email from today that will have, um, again, just some of these links in it. It'll have a copy or a link to this video if you want to go back and have another look at it. 
Um, uh, yeah, and that's that's kind of about all that we have uh, have to run through today. So just one last chance for any final questions. No? All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for your time. It's been nice to meet you all. Um, good luck with your deliberations. Um, and please do not hesitate to shout out if we can answer any questions for you whatsoever.